Hello students and welcome to e Shala. I am Prerna Trehan, Assistant Professor at GGDSD College, Punjab University. In today's module, we will be looking at one of the leading lights of the Indian national struggle, Bal Gangadhar Tilak. After this module, you shall be able to understand Tilak's contribution to the Indian freedom struggle. Secondly, you shall also be clear on his national and political thought. Lastly, we shall also be looking at his plan of action, that is his theory of protest. The nationalistic movement was articulated differently in different phases of India's freedom struggle. Apart from ideological shifts, there were noticeable differences in social background of those who participated in the struggle against the British. For instance, the Gandhian phase of Indian nationalism, also known as the phase of mass nationalism, radically altered the nature of the constituencies of nationalism by incorporating his therefore neglected sections of the Indian society. That Gandhi inaugurated a completely new phase in Indian freedom struggle can be easily shown by contrasting it with its earlier phases, namely the moderate and extremist phases. In contemporary historiography, the moderate phase begins with the formation of the Indian National Congress in 1885 and continued till the 1907 Surat Congress from where on the extremists appeared on the political scene. The basic difference between those two groups laid in their perception of anti-British struggle and its articulation in concrete programs. While moderates opposed the British in a strictly constitutional way, extremists favoured a strategy of direct action to harm the British economic and political interests in India. It is with the aim of this unit that we shall focus on the political thought of B.G. Tilak and his theory of protest. Bal Gangadhar Tilak is popularly known as Lok Manya, that is respected by people and was born a middle class Chitpavan Brahman family in Ratnagiri on 23rd July 1856. From his teacher, Father, he inherited his love for Sanskrit, which gave him a deep respect for the ancient religion and traditions of the country. As the Maratha rule was the last viable native regime in India to be extinguished by the British, he was roused to thinking about India's independence. He resolved to devote his life to the cause of education, which he felt was the best way of serving people. After graduating from Deccan College, Pune in 1876, he, along with some co-patriots, started a public career by launching New English School, Pune, an English-language weekly, Maharata, and a Maharathi weekly, Kesari. His editorship of these journals made Tilak deeply involved in the social and political affairs of Maharashtra and Western India. In Kesari, he developed his unique style of communicating ideas, which was both forceful and homely and full of allusions to Sanskrit, regional lore and history. Tilak's main concern in life was political emancipation of India. However, neither was he a realist, nor was he able to conceptualize his ideas in some theory. Political Ideas of Tilak Tilak firmly believed that the state and the king must exist for the development and survival of man. He was an ardent supporter of rule of law and democracy. Again, Tilak believed that the king and the people had obligations towards one another, and the concept of Pragradroha, which meant the crime of treason by the king to the people, and argued that Pragradroha did not find place philosophical foundations of Tilak's political thought, Swaraj. Tilak was a practical politician, and his political philosophy is a unique blend of Indian value system and Western liberalism. Tilak's political ideas were formulated during his political career as a national leader of India's freedom movement from 1885 to 1920. So to understand the character of his political thought, it is necessary to briefly review his political career. The issues that were singled out with, by Tilak were Commissioner Crawford's corrupt administration, the incutisk system of land revenue, the British policy of divide and rule, and the British partisanship towards Muslims. During the 90s, Tilak participated actively in annual conferences of Indian National Congress. In 1891 Annual Congress, he moved the resolution on the Arms Act, which demanded changes in gun prohibition regulations and called for more Indian participation in the military. His first significant political move was to relegate the issue of social reform to the background in favour of political reform, for which he led agitations against the British rulers. 
In order to make Congress concentrate on political reforms in 1895, he succeeded in separating the annual meetings of Social Conference and the Indian National Congress, which used to meet consecutively at the same venue with several common delegates. From 1898 to 1908, Tilak was at the peak of his political career as national leader. He, along with Lala Lajpat Rai and Bipin Chandrapal, constituted the national leadership triad, which was referred to as Lal Bal Pal, popularized a four-fold program of action for the annulment of the partition of Bengal, that is Swaraj, self-government, Swadeshi, resort to Indian goods, Bahishkar, that is boycott of foreign goods, and Rashtriya Shikshan, that is national education. In a whirlwind tour of the country, he came to be identified with his famous slogan that is Swaraj is my birthright and I shall have it. Tilak wrote the Gita Sahaya, a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. In it, he analyzed the teachings of Gita, comparing it with Indian and Western schools of thought. He also exhorted the people to lead an activist human life, that is to follow Karma Yoga, that is the way of work or the performance of duties in a spirit of selflessness. He started a Home Rule League along the lines of Irish Home Rule movement in order to further the cause of India's self-rule. He also played a leading role in bringing about the 1916 Lucknow Pact between the Congress and the Muslim League. He was also an early advocate of Swadeshi movement against the British economic domination. His death on 1st August 1920 closed an era in Indian national movement. Tilak recognized four connotations of the term Swaraj. Firstly, for him, it meant that the ruler and people are of the same country, religion or race. Second, it refers to a well-organized state or system of rule of law. Third, it means a government promoting the well-being of the people. Fourthly, for which Tilak had his strongest preference was that government elected by and responsible to the people. Tilak supported the right of the people to participate in the government of their country. According to Tilak, a democratic government by its very nature is bound to promote the people's welfare. He opined that the ideal of democratic polity would be better served if, if political science were to be redesignated as Rajniti Shastra. He further maintained that as Indians were suffering from harmful effects of British rule and had become aware of the advantages of democracy, the time was ripe for the Indian nationalism and Swaraj. Swaraj for Tilak had not only political connotation but also a moral spiritual connotation. He described Swaraj in the following words, It is a life centered in self and dependent upon self. There is Swaraj in this world as well as in the world thereafter. The rishis who laid down the rules of the law of duty took upon themselves, took to forests, and because the people all, were already enjoying Swaraj or people's domination, which was administered and defended in the first instance by Kshatriya kings. At the Lucknow Congress of 1916, Tilak raised the famous slogan of Swaraj is my birthright. In the same year, he and Annie Besant started the Home Rule League. He was also opposed to the utilitarian ethics as found in Bentham's principle of the greatest happiness of greatest number. He considered it to be very vague as pointed out by Tilak. How is greatest happiness to be determined? Is it the quantity of the happiness to be preferred or its quality? In cases of conflict over empirical determination of the principle, whose opinion is to prevail? In the place of utilitarian formula, Tilak favoured the good of all principle contained in Vedas and Bhagavad Gita. Further, he assigned a special role to spiritual leaders or yogis. Moreover, in other words, inner happiness was seen by Tilak as being superior to external happiness. According to him, a person's conduct is not to be merely evaluated on the basis of its outward effects, but also on the basis of inner motives and feelings. He also gave importance to reason like Kant. Tilak gave importance to reason. According to him, one whose reason is absolute and pure cannot sin. He emphasized on the spiritual freedom of the individual, basing it on the Vedanta philosophy. In keeping with the political thought of Vedas, Ramayana, Mahabharata, Kautilya's Arthashastra, Shukra Niti, Kandaka Niti Shastra, Tilak asserted that it was the duty of the king to promote the welfare of the people. After tracing the term Swarajan to the Vedas, he pointed out that since people have the essence of God in them, they have the right to remove oppressive rulers. He further firmly believed that the divine right of the people to hold their rulers accountable to themselves. Tilak believed that Hindu philosophy was superior to the other philosophies and religions. He wrote, 
It is a permanent and undauntable religion, and the Blessed Lord has not felt necessity for Hindus to rely on any other book or religion. According to Vedanta philosophy, reality is ultimately non-dualistic and man's final goal is to become one with the Paramatman that is the Absolute Self. The Bhagavad Gita teaches that man can and must achieve this self-fulfillment through Karma Yoga, that is through a life dedicated to the performance of one's duties in this world in a selfless or disinterested manner, for Lok Sangrehe, that is well-being of all. Tilak now divided the hedonistic philosophers into three categories. That is first, the advocates of self-interest, the advocates of enlightened self-interest, and thirdly, the proponents of the compatibility of self-interest with common interests. He had the least esteem for the first category, which included Charvaka, Jabali of Ramayana, and Kani Kananiti of Mahabharata. Tilak's conception of Indian nationalism was an amalgamation of diverse strands of thought, pride in the legacy of ancient India, appreciation for the rule of British rule in bringing about political and administrative unification of the country, appreciation of Western learning and science, recognition of economic exploitation by foreign rulers, and recognition of the need to reform a national and political new movement of the people across barriers of race, caste, religion, and sex. Tilak thought of nationalism as operating at two levels, the regional and the national. He believed that a regional historical hero or a regional religious symbol could concretize the national sentiment and sentiment in the people. As he matured as a national leader, the countrywide strand of his idea of Indian nationalism engulfed and assimilated the regional strand. Although he remained a devout Hindu and gave priority to the political self-rule movement over social reform movement, the impact of Western education on him was impressive. From it, he derived his commitment to the liberal values of constitutional government, rule of law, individual freedom, freedom of the press, scientific progress, and freedom of political expression and organization. His advocacy of national freedom and self-rule within the British Empire was also the result of his Western education. He attacked British rule as unconstitutional and detrimental to the basic political rights of Indians. Earlier in 1892, he had gone to the extent of admiring the generosity, far-sightedness and wisdom of the British electorate in returning Dada Bhai Naroji to the House of Commons from central Finsbury. Tilak retained his admiration for Britain's contribution to the colonial government and parliamentary democracy, liberal values and freedom, and the field of science and technology. He stood for the application of the principle of rationality and scientific logical reasoning to political and economic spheres, but not to the social religious sphere. Thus, Tilak's conception of nationalism was a combination of Vedanta ideal of spiritual unity of humanity and Western notions of nationalism as propounded by Mazzini, Burke, Mill and Wilson. He was influenced by the development of nationalism in the world at large. Mill understood the basis of nationalism as being both objective and subjective. Such objective factors such as common language, territory, religion contribute to the psychological or subjective feeling of oneness amongst people. These subjective psychological feelings are indeed of fundamental importance of nationalism. Tilak believed that nationalism can be promoted and strengthened if people's psychological bonds are given symbolic expressions of an objective, visible or concrete type, namely flags, insignia, celebration of social and religious festivals. Accordingly, Tilak revived the Ganpati festival and used it as a means to foster unity of Brahmins and non-Brahmins. Similarly, he also played a leading role in organizing Shivaji festivals. In addition to celebration of these festivals, Tilak also used social movements and he looked upon different linguistic com communities of India as sub-nationalities. He believed that the unity that language provides to the people of a region has to be strengthened. But more than language, it was Hinduism which according to him was the uniting force of the whole of India. The more important components of nationalism 
according to him, with a political mobilization under the national movement and the nationalistic economic ideology. Tilak concentrated not only on cultural or religious basis for information, but also on economic basis of it. He shared economic ideas of moderate nationalists like Ranade, Naroji, Arsidat and Gokhale. But unlike them, he maintained that economic issues had to be exploited to rouse people's political consciousness and strengthen the freedom struggle. He endorsed Dadabhai Naroji's famous drain theory of British rule in India. Furthermore, he advocated a greater role to the state in agricultural development. But while Dath was a moderate in his political outlook, Tilak was an extremist. He had a romantic view of village self-sufficiency and strove to mobilize peasants, artisans, craftsmen and urban dwellers to the freedom struggle. Tilak opposed the standpoint of the moderates that social reform was necessarily an antecedent to political freedom. To him, securing of political rights from British rule was of primary importance. Moreover, he feared that any emphasis on social reform would lead to social schisms and to greater bureaucratic interference by the colonial administration. Tilak urged the people to resort to direct action. Furthermore, he believed that the political methods and political concepts have different meanings in different socio-historical and political contexts. He maintained that what is constitutional and legal to the imperialist rulers and their supporters might really be unjust and immoral, not merely from the standpoint of the people of the colonies, but also from a broad humanistic standpoint. Government regulations and laws, he averred, should be evaluated not simply in terms of constitutionality and legality, but in terms of justice, morality as well. The people, he believed, had the right and the duty to resist just immoral laws. Tilak, the most prominent of the extremists, exhorted that Swaraj is my birthright and without Swaraj there could be no social reform, no industrial progress, no useful education, no fulfillment of national life. And that is what we seek and that is why God has sent us into the world to fulfill it. In appreciation of his attitude, Bipin Pal, a member of the Lal Bal Pal group, was categorical in stating, firstly, that the principle of the goal of extremist struggle was the abdication of the right of England to determine the policy of Indian government, the relinquishment of the right or to present despotism to enact whatever law they pleased to govern the people of the country. Secondly, the extremists were not hesitant in championing violence, if necessary, to advance the cause of the nation, while moderates favoured constitutional and peaceful means as most appropriate to avoid friction with the ruler. In contrast with these means, extremists resorted to boycott and swadeshi that never really evoked support from the moderates. Simultaneously with the boycott of government offices, the extremists also propagated boycott of foreign goods and promotion of swadeshi or homespun. This strategy, first adopted in context of 1905 Bengal partition agitation, was further extended to the nationalistic campaign as a whole, presumably because of its effectiveness in creating and sustaining the nationalistic zeal. The economic boycott was characterized by contemporary parlance, caused consternation amongst the British industrialists more than the other types of boycott. Thirdly, the moderates appeared to be happy under the British, presumably because of their belief that Indians were not at all capable of self-rule. Views of the extremists were, of, for obvious reasons, diametrically opposite to this idea. Furthermore, he values freedom for his own sake and desires autonomy, immediate and unconditional regardless of any considerations of fitness or unfitness of the people for it. Here to the moderate and extremist distinction is based on certain ideological differences. While the former supported a loyalist discourse, the latter simply rejected the stance in the articulation of anti-imperialism. Fourthly, in the extremist conceptualization of struggle against imperialism, the idea of self-sacrifice, including the supreme sacrifice, figured prominently in moderate scheme of political struggle. This idea appeared to have received no attention. This probably indicates two different phases of extremism. On one hand, there was public appearance where strategies of boycott, swadeshi and strike were pursued to articulate the nationalistic protest. The sudden violent attack was on the other, also encouraged to terrorize British administration that was rattled following the incessant violent interventions by those who preferred underground military operations. Thus, it can be safely concluded that Tilak played a significant role in India's struggle for independence by contributing in all spheres, be it political, social or religious. 
he was an extremist as compared to moderates. He envisaged a significant role for religion in national movement, but was also against its misuse to divide the society. He was in favor of organic revolutionary and spontaneous social reform. At the same time, he was also against thoughtless imitation of the West. B.G. Tilak was an independence activist who was also a journalist, teacher, social reformer and lawyer. He died on August 1st in the year 1920 and is known for his quote, Swaraj is my birthright and I shall have it, which is the most prominent of all the valuable teachings that he put forth. In conclusion, we are able to note that Bal Gangadhar Tilak was both an extremist as well as a devout nationalist. His political thought was influenced by four specific means of Swaraj, Swadeshi, boycott as well as national education. He further used religion as an effective weapon to unite the country and promote some ideas of social reform. B.G. Tilak's idea emphasizing on social and political unity remain even more important today in promoting the idea of both internal and external Swaraj in today's India. Thank you.